Hello, and welcome back to SuperCloud for our episode four of our series, identifying the next generation cloud. This topic is on generative AI, how cloud technology, next gen cloud is evolving with generative AI and guest here is Ori Goshen is the co-founder and co-CEO of AI21 Labs. CUBE alumni was on six months ago and you know, six months things change in AI. Ori, thank you for coming uh, back on theCUBE for SuperCloud 4. Thank you for having me. You know, we had a really great chat six months ago on the startup showcase. You guys were highlighted with your partnership with AWS, obviously one of the big hyperscalers in this now multi-cloud world. Um, your interview really resonated with folks, certainly in our audience, and we took out a bunch of highlights from that. Many were really around what's now obvious, but six months ago, a lot's changed. You know, people are realizing the value of this wave, that the humans are in, in, in control, the creative class is emerging and the infrastructure and tooling is needed. So a lot of those comments resonated. We're back at the table six months later. I have to, first question I have to ask you is, you know, with, with respect to the generative AI hype, there's a lot of reality matching the hype and which you don't really see in these super hyped up markets where you get a lot of hype and then you, you get value matching pretty quickly. So much has changed in the six months. Just go back six months when you were last on theCUBE. Uh, what's changed? <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lot, and uh, and actually, I think the whole this whole space probably changed multiple times. Um, but I think um, if we kind of zoom out for a second, um, I think you know nine months ago, six months ago, when we were still at um, kind of sporadic exploration, uh, people were uh, trying to figure out what can be achieved with this technology and. Uh, there was some initial momentum behind testing and uh, understanding the capacities and the limitations. And I think this is just shifted towards uh, massive experimentation. So there's almost no company, no enterprise on earth that uh, is not looking in how this impacts the business and you know, thinking it at the, at the board level. Um, I think um, it really reached that kind of um, um, attention and, and visibility, and you know that 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 drove a lot of interest, and um, and I think we're you know we're now still at the phase where um, most enterprises are uh, still experimenting with the technology, doing some POCs testing and to kind of understand the, uh, the again, the, the capacities and the limitations. And the next six months, we'll probably see more and more uh, uh, production deployments, like gradually going to production and uh, the, um, uh, implementing some of these use cases and testing them in, in, in um, um, you know, a scale kind of uh, setup. Um, and then we'll have probably another six months of uh, enterprises understanding, well, really measuring the ROI um, on, on these use cases they've tested. Like, what's the impact on the business? Uh, is it really economical? And, and from what I'm seeing, and I'm, you know, I'm speaking here in very much intuitively, I think some of the use cases will, uh, will be uh, maybe flashy and kind of uh, really cool, but not necessarily prove themselves as, um, as uh, you know, in terms of ROI. And others will be um, just dramatic ROI, more more than people have expected or anticipated before. So that's kind of a, the perspective I'm seeing yeah. from the last six months, uh, kind of a year from now, where we're yeah. where we're heading. It's great. I love chatting with you because you know we we talk to everyone as we can as much as possible. And the same kind of trend we see, just to validate your point, is there's a lot of development going on. And and I want to get into that open source aspect of it in a minute. But you're right. I think this is an important point. In every new market like this, is a lot of experimentation and there's a lot of flashy demos. Great. I mean, good products. I mean, you've, if you have data, you can create a good app. The question then is, what's the scale look like, right? And this comes back down to every early market. This is the same pattern. I remember with the web and some mobile apps, the demos were kick ass. And then the question was, I will never scale. You got to be technical debt. This is pretty easy to work that down. Once you get a success point, this 
this is the development playbook now, okay? Identify some use cases, less ambiguity the better and, and for the low hanging fruit, but it's okay to have a flashy demo if you got some working data, right? Then the next question is, what's the scale look like? And it's not so much tech stack, it's, or it's, it could be cloud because we've got GPUs and needed TPUs, whatever, but it's what data is available. So take us through your thoughts on that sequence from flash in the pan, demo, great demo, prove it. Now produce a production ready, scalable app. What does that look like? Yeah, I think there are several aspects people are um, now um, uh, struggling with. Uh, kind of, they, they describe this gap between a flashy demo and um, um, uh, uh, use case in production. Um, and the gap, uh, the aspects are, you know, there's the whole issue of uh, security and how do you manage how do you manage data uh, in this regime where if you're trying to customize these models, then some of the data is becoming available through these models actually can be extracted through these models. So how do you manage the whole um, security and data governance? I think this is a this is a big theme. Um, another theme is uh, costs. Um, whatever works in in a you know in a small demo. What what happens if you you know scale it, deploy it for your customers or for even your internal employees? And you know it may not be economical at all. And um, and another consideration is uh, or another aspect is uh, reliability. I think this is the, the biggest one. Um, and hardest one to crack. Um, and it goes back to what this technology is. I mean, these um, uh, large language models are essentially, um, you know, they're, they're stochastic um, systems. So, and they will, uh, and these, you know, these are statistical by nature. So they will make mistakes and they will uh, hallucinate. So how do you overcome this challenge and how do you provide uh, the level of transparency and the explainability and uh, and also also kind of make sure that the results you're and the outputs you're giving in, in you know mission critical environments are are true because this could lead to uh, obviously uh, this could have some serious consequences. So I think now the people are uh, experimenting this technology and gradually deploying them and experimenting with actual yeah. usage, they start to uh, face these uh, these challenges. Um, and and I think there's 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 a path to move forward, but these are real challenges that um, will 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 we'll take uh, <laughs> will take some time to to crack. Well, great. We're going to get, let's get into the conversation. Great, great, great riff there. For the folks watching, Ori is the co-founder and co-CEO of AI21 Labs. They've raised a total of $283 million, valuing the company over 1.4 billion. It came out of stealth in October, 2020 with the first AI writing tool, WordTune. They have a flagship product, AI21 Studio, pay as you go developer platform for building custom text-based applications. Doing a great job. And again, six months ago, we featured them on our startup showcase uh, with AWS, obviously one of the big clouds uh, and super cloud players. Uh, in, that, in that conversation, I, you, you talked about a lot of things I want to shape into this uh, conversation and this, this discussion. Um, one was the role of open source. In our previous conversation, you highlighted that using existing found using existing foundation models, whether open source or proprietary, is what people are doing. How do you see the role of open source communities evolving in the development and democratization of the generative AI wave? I think uh, open source has a, has a super significant role uh, in this space. I mean, uh, more of the, I think a lot of the uh, research and progress we are seeing not right now in the accelerated uh, pace of progress uh, is due to the open source uh, community. Um, I do want to highlight that there's uh, there are uh, several nuances when you speak about uh, open source. Um, having the weights of the models um, uh, released and open sourced, and you know there are different types of licenses. Um, is one thing. I think if we 
if we really want to attribute uh, full open source, you'd expect um, uh, the, the researchers or the organizations to release the code for training and the data. Uh, so I think that's a full open source version. And there are some cases, I think there are some organizations that go to take that path of um, full open source, but the most, the most common uh, practice we're seeing is actually that partial open source where they just release the weights. And the weights, you can think about these as, as binaries, like you can't, it's not like code, you cannot do a lot of things with it, but you can fine tune it, like you can continue training the models and you can um, use them. So I'm not saying it's, it's, it's um, I'm not saying it's unuseful, but, uh, but still, Kind of, I think it's it's good to calibrate of what open source means. It means different things in this context. So, but but broadly broadly speaking, I think it had tremendous effect on the uh, research and the pace of research we're seeing uh, we're seeing right now. And I also think um, in a couple of years from now, we won't be speaking about large language models. We'll be speaking about AI systems that um, en encapsulate those and perhaps even use a portfolio of large language models. And then I think the open source we, we may have even a more significant uh, role because you'd, you'd be able to, um, again, use these specialized models for different purposes, for different cases. And, um, and, and I, I guess that uh, we'll see more energy and activity on the on the open source that will allow it to just proliferate it. So I'm 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 big believer in that direction. Yeah. Um, I do think there is um, a lot of value in the proprietary models. Um, just the just the way it's um, uh, being um, you know trained and evaluated and um, and then again, in the context of an AI system, I think it's really important to own that the model piece, or at least for some of the capabilities, you want to own the model piece so you can um, have the performance guarantees that you need um, to, to make a reliable system. So I think you're onto something that I want to just unpack a little bit since you brought it up. I like how you said AI system because one, it's AI and the word system. I've always been, you know me, I've been ranting about systems thinking uh, as a skill set. You know, we've seen the evolution of iteration and design thinking, you know, you know, cloud first. I think a data first or AI first thought process has to have a systems construct. And so, because AI is a system, it's, a, it's got consequences when you make changes. It's an operating system. In a way, you're bringing up a good point about this nuance around open source and what's not open source. I mean, open source was built generationally on the old computing model of proprietary software and available hardware. Okay, I remember the days back in the PC revolution, software ran on hardware and hardware had to have an operating system, but they had chips. Chips were proprietary. Intel was probably the most proprietary product on the planet at that point, but no one really cared about Intel. They did great processors. In a way, we're seeing something similar with AI if you overlay this super cloud concept around AI and say, um, for this a thought exercise, what if open source wasn't old school, it was new school, meaning the data is open sourced and these other models can be proprietary if they're a hardened top or a system that works, that makes the system work. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it's, it's kind of a riff here, but I want to get your thoughts because this is a, a generational potential shift in what the operating model will look like for AI, which will impact the applications and ultimately the end value. Yeah, I think that um, uh, there's um, uh, a computational paradigm shift here uh, because of these uh, stochastic uh, statistical systems that we call large language models um, or generative models. Um, so, I think one way to look at it is from an architectural point of view is that we have these models, we're trying to encode the, um, all the knowledge or 
maximum amount of knowledge inside of them and 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 try to make the models better and you know more performant i think that's that's one approach and, and it has its uh, uh, merits um but i think um probably what we'll see if i had to estimate is actually a more decompositional approach where uh, we won't have this one model to rule them all. We'll have um, a set of smaller models or combination of big ones and small ones, which is a portfolio and a uh, very sophisticated orchestration layer that uh, operates these models. And um, that orchestration layer is uh, considering the statistical nature of the model, understanding that these could produce errors and um, and how, how do we treat them? How would we deal with them? How do we minimize them? Would be part of the orchestration layer um, uh, job. Yeah. So I think this, this kind of describes what it means to have, have um, an AI system um, uh, instead of uh, a model. And I think, and I think you're right. I think uh, the analogy where we have, we'll have, you know, proprietary models, but uh, open source systems could happen. And, and it could be also a combination where we'll have open source models, proprietary models and open source systems that, yeah. uh, that will be the main, um, the main, uh, I mean, the main, the, the, the mainstream and be adopted by, uh, by, by, by most of the developers. And we, you know, we can also speculate that if data is the intellectual property, and you talk a lot about this uh, in the market, I've watched some of your interviews around, you know, how this AI systems can scale intellectual uh, capabilities, knowledge workers, um, really a big creative class development could come out of this. And so, you know, you're seeing companies who have proprietary data, that's their own, whether that's protected, that's now intellectual capital and property. So. Okay, security and sharing that. So it brings up the question of, of integration of models. Uh, if you have a system, you obviously maybe have some proprietary and open. The fusion of you know, a model from a finance department maybe, or a sales or technology or machine log files could be part of a blended model, right? So the future of foundation models are really the discussion here, right? So you know, it, the AI landscape's evolving. You're seeing specialized models and certainly enterprises will have those, so will people with a distinct advantage. You're going to have public models, open and proprietary. This is an emphasis on, the, on this power law, right? You've got the big fat models and then you've got the, 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 the more evergreen, more maybe custom, less costly, maybe smaller. The rise of smaller models is out there now, right? So, and then you've got the integration questions. I and mean, if we're, if the cloud is API based, and you brought this up in our last conversation, APIs is a lingua franca for the cloud. Are models going to be API based? Is there an, is our vector databases going to work together? What about embeddings? I mean, these are new questions. What's the integration and how do models work together? How do you construct an AI system if you have the benefits of all these potential models? It could be foundational or they could be NLP systems. Right. Yeah, I think, I think it's a great, uh, it's a great architectural uh, question. This is actually one of the areas we um, we invest and we spend a lot of our uh, research, um, and it it fundamentally goes to uh, why we started the company, and uh, and the, the the fundamental reason was that uh, we believe in a kind of a neuro symbolic hybrid mode where uh, some of the com computational um, jobs are should be done symbolically i mean there's there's no need to um uh kind of uh conduct operational uh logical operations uh, uh neurally right that that it's not the, the the neural strength and uh you would there are certain things you wouldn't uh want to apply strict rules it's too brittle so the question is how do you how you marry the two and how you mix uh both of them and and that kind of it also go, goes back to your uh, integration question. How do you, how do we mix and match? How do you use different models for different purposes? And uh, I think we'll see some really cool progress on that front uh, in, 
the in the next uh, in the next couple of months. Um, so so stay tuned. Is that on your side or just generally in the industry <laughs> or both? Uh, I guess both. <laughs> okay, all right, cool. You don't want to share anything. You want to get the secrets out there too early. Uh, we'll definitely be following up on that. I definitely want to do more about this AI system. I think that is really a great uh, vision and I think that's the reality. We're going to move to a new operating model. It's very clear to the super cloud conversations we're having. And it's going to be completely different in our opinion. We don't yet know what it looks like, but it's it's going to just evolve. And once it pops into, into view, everyone's going to jump on that bandwagon. Um, the, the question I want to ask you that's kind of on everyone's mind is the infrastructure and scalability side. And you, you, you talked about it a little bit earlier uh, in this conversation around scale. You know, the, everyone wants to know how much it's going to cost, but the, the bigger question is, as the apps start growing, what's the big knobs to turn for managing scale, not just from a cost perspective, just from a, just growth. GPUs are obviously the hot conversation. Google's got TPUs, you know, hardware and the silicon is going to be very important. What, what's going to be the most and crucial piece of infrastructure? Um, you know, what advances or changes do you anticipate being crucial for sustaining the AI boom? Sure, I think um, um, maybe a couple of trends. Um, so first you'll have, so what we see in, you know, in, in like, I don't know, 99% of enterprise use cases are not about open-ended, you know, general, general purpose um, chat systems. Uh, it's not, it's not about, it's not about that. It's about a fairly narrow um, types of tasks that are interested, uh, that the enterprise is interested in. And it also typically um, deeply integrated within an application or, uh, or a workflow that the, that the enterprise is interested in. And if that's the mode of operation, then I think, again, instead of going to, uh, uh, going after the, uh, uh, um, um, uh, large, very large models that are capable of doing many, many things and are extremely flexible. I think a more uh, pragmatic, practical approach would be to have these um, specialized systems, right, that are really good at particular tasks. And um, taking a, that approach would allow you to um, a um, you know run this on much more compact on on basically smaller chips that are much e much cheaper to serve and um and b uh some of these chips are actually uh far more available than the uh you know large uh, large uh, uh systems um the large and fairly new systems so that that uh, i think will create the advantage of uh both having the the lower cost and uh, higher availability yeah. and um and that's that's something that um uh, is, is 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 definitely something a lot of uh, a lot of companies face right now the lack of availability of compute resources so that's why i think it's this architectural uh decision is uh, is is really important for uh getting your application or the idea from a small scale to a large scale. Great point. And that, you know, in this market where there's demand and, and there's a growing market, um, the entrepreneurs will be creative and the big providers will figure it out. That's called innovation. Um, great point. Uh, the question I want to get into now is you've mentioned the human piece of it before, human loop, getting human, humans in the loop. And I think that, that resonated well. Also a point you made in our last conversation I want to get your thoughts on is you mentioned that um, every industry is going to be disrupted from, from industrial to medical. Uh, every vertical is going to have uh, C gender AI. That's clearly the case. Almost every event we go to, it's like the same line. Every industry is going to be disrupted. Okay, great. You were right. Can you provide some examples of, uh, or predictions of how gender AI might revolutionize these non-tech sectors? Because I think what's happening is the non-techie industries are leaning in heavily and even some regulated industries because by the way regulated industries have all that 
labeling done because of compliance. So it's kind of like interesting point, right? Exactly. The ambiguity's not really there. So it really doesn't really care. There's not going to hallucinate if it's got a, some policy and some, some fixed uh, data. So we're seeing regulated industries leaning in more. So um, what's your thoughts? You're in the middle of it. What, what's, what examples in the non-tech areas? Uh, what, what are some revolutionary uh, things happening? Yeah, I actually think that uh, the more traditional industries will benefit and will uh, will actually be surprising, but they'll be the ones who are massively adopting it first. Um, and and um, yeah, just maybe to give you a, a, a couple of examples. Um, so think about the pharmaceutical industry. Um, uh, we've been we've been working with um, a few players um, on uh, you know drug discovery use cases where um, using you know these language um, systems now um, um, a company like a, a pharmaceutical company can really accelerate the, the the drug discovery process because it has typically has you know research of millions of documents uh, of studies and, and things that you know were put for for years and when you use uh, quite primitive search tools yes you can extract info and find clues for interesting um, connections but if you have a you know very strong generative system that's uh, you know sort of retrieval based then suddenly you can gain new insight, things, connections you haven't imagined. Like as a, as a, as a human being, you haven't thought of before. So you suddenly start to make new discoveries. And, and I think that's, you know, it sounds, sounds small, but that types of new insights, and you can think about it also as, um, as a type of uh, an hypothesis generator. Um, this could, this would, totally um, uh, disrupt the, the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. So I think it has, it is just has a big impact. And, um, and regulated industries, I think there, there will be uh, impacted uh, as well, pretty extensively. Um, just because now uh, they have so many, you know, cumbersome uh, processes in place, uh, like to make a decision or make an action you sometimes need an army of people to make sure you know all the yeah. um, all, all the constraints are satisfied and you're you're working you know by, by the rules and everything but if you can um if you can accelerate that if you can have a machine augmenting uh humans and uh providing them the information that they need quicker um, and um, help them with some of the reasoning. I'm not saying it's it's going to give you the you know, the, the bottom line, the end conclusion. Um, but I think some of the reasoning could be offloaded to these types of systems. So I think this will enable um, these types of regulated uh, organizations. It will enable their employees to uh, focus on their jobs and have the assistive uh, system to to help them with uh, figuring out all sorts of uh, reg, 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 regulation issues. So I think the, 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 both of these examples um, kind of show how uh, this is actually going to impact almost uh, any industry we know of. It's really interesting. And some of these industries like pharmaceutical healthcare, um, where you have these experts at the top of the pyramid and skill set you know, and is is always had to be, you know, and were they almost like savant brilliant, right? And they they were masters at their trade or grandmasters in chess, for instance. And chess, it's well documented. You know, be a grandmaster in chess, there's only very few people that were at that level. But when you introduce computers, humans plus computers, the number of grandmasters increased, okay? And because the humans had augmentation with the machines and you add AI and it's well documented. Believe me, the chess world is highly doc vocal about <laughs> the relationship between computers, man versus a computer, computer versus computer, humans and computers versus humans and humans plus computers versus. Right. So it, the trend is clear. Humans 
at the top will be more knowledgeable. So in chess, the grandmaster in the elite category, the computer AI assistants made someone who was almost a grandmaster a grandmaster because it gave him extra capabilities to think. So it created- yeah, It's like a thought partner. Yes, yeah, a partner. And so this intellectual scaling step function is happening with AI. I want to get your thoughts on, you've talked about this, you've hinted on the last time you're on theCUBE, this idea of AI can scale intellect, which is data, which is in people's heads as well. So what, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, uh, thinking about knowledge worker broadly, like every, um, you know, knowledge worker in every industry. Uh, so um, our jobs could be reduced to um, be described in a very kind of compact way is that we're consuming information, uh, we're producing or synthesizing uh, insights. And uh, during that process, we're, you know, we're conducting reasoning. Um, and that's, that's uh, uh, the, main, uh, the, the main job that we're actually doing. So I think in all of these three parts that I mentioned, the AI assistance will just provide uh, a very dramatic boost. Like from consuming information, this would be um, uh, much more um, uh, faster and productive than it's uh, it's been done today. Like uh, finding the right information and even um, doing compositional stuff. Like you know, I want to uh, compare between uh, two different things and tell me all about it. And in a <laughs> in a you know, in a click of a button, we'll get it. Yeah. And um, and then there. The, the reasoning piece is also interesting because we can start um, offloading problems to the uh, to the to the system, not just um, of a way of surfacing relevant information, but we can actually combine the in the relevant information with problems we're facing, and we'll use these systems to help us solve these problems, or at least suggest a way to solve these problems. And then um, when thinking about writing and communication, of course, these systems are really good at um, drafting and generating and ideating and all these types of capabilities um, will, again, augment us. So I think that in our day-to-day -day jobs, uh, this will have a tremendous uh, effect yeah. on, the, on, the, on, on our working uh, environment and um, may free maybe I think that's one of the predictions I heard that it may may help us free free a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I'm I kind of thinking about it from a you know com competitive standpoint. May, may it may not, but at least uh, we as um, humans will will devote much of our thinking and uh, energies towards the things we're really good at. Yeah, it'll make our um, minds, so, it'll, it'll help us have more free time to think and do things either creatively. I mean, no one really sits on the beach all day. I mean, people, we're human, we do things. So, I mean, I basically exactly. what you're saying, I mean, so maybe next time when we talk, I'll plug the two transcripts from this interview into uh, AI21 Lab Studios and I'll ask it to do the interview for me. What do you think about that one? <laughs> <laughs> Are we there yet? I think, you know? <laughs> I actually think we're not that far, I think, but now the question is, uh, what type of, um, you know, re result are you expecting? <laughs> um, uh, at, at the end of the day, you may end up with pretty boring interviews. Uh, so, uh, I'll, 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 I'll uh, throw out an architectural diagram of the AI system we just riffed on, and including which ve best vector database to use uh, in, in the system. See what that, what comes up. <laughs> yeah, that 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 that'd be interesting. Well, Ari, I really appreciate you. We're good riff, good good keynote conversation here around SuperCloud Four. I think it was important we hit those architectural things. In the last minute we have left, uh, put a plug in for what you guys are doing right now. What's the coolest thing you're working on? How do people engage with you guys and become a customer? What are some of the onboarding best practices? How do I jump in if someone wants to jump in and use uh, AI Twenty One Lab Studio? What what what's the playbook? Put a commercial in, put a plug. 
Yeah, so uh, AI21.com, uh, you go and you sign up for our studio uh, platform. And um, one of the things we're um, making available there is our task specific uh, systems that are optimized for specific tasks like summarization and grounded question answering and generating different types of content. And, um, and we have, um, uh, we have a solution architect team that go works together with enterprises and it has a six weeks program where we uh, build a solution together and uh, and provide um, a, 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 a deployed POC that people can actually uh, touch and experiment and extract value and then we and then we take customers and and go to production uh, and again in a matter of uh, weeks not months. So um, yeah. we're we're very excited about this uh, revolution, and uh, our mission currently is to uh, take enterprises and help them in this journey and uh, make them uh, successful and gain value from uh, from from the revolution we're experiencing. Ari, right, thank you so much, Ari Goshen, co-founder, co-CEO of AI Twenty One Labs, here on SuperCloud Generator. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll be right back for more SuperCloud 4 coverage after this short break.